Well, good morning, church family. Um, it is good to speak from behind the TV this morning. Not really. Um, okay, so we have a lot of things happening in the service today, towards the end of the service, but um, we are enjoying a family Sunday, which means our, our elementary school students are here with us um, in big church today. So with that, I have to give a disclaimer. So parents, um, I try to do this from time to time. If we're gonna engage in some conversation that you're gonna have to follow up when you go home, I wanna make sure you know that ahead of time. So be thinking through the sermon, because you may have to tell your kids, we don't do everything that Pastor Kevin has done. This is one of those moments. This would actually be like a PG-16, PG-17 storyline uh, for today, but we have some, some good things that we're gonna talk about. But I wanna jump back into my childhood because this is summertime and, and there's a big holiday coming up, July 4th. And so for, for me on the street that I grew up on, which was a dead end street, there were kids everywhere from 17 years of age down to, I think at that point, maybe eight. And we all did things. We played football, we played ba baseball together, we played tag, we played the entire you know, dead end street from one end to the other was involved in the tag game and, and sometimes games would last for hours. But one of the things we always looked forward to was saving our money. And you're thinking to yourself as a kid, and I was like 10 years old, you're looking forward to saving your money, absolutely. So here's what would happen. Starting in probably the end of school, you know, somewhere in May, we would start having conversations on Saturday mornings with our friends at, on, on the street to say, have you started saving your money yet? Now you would think that Dame, Dave Ramsey had come <clears throat> and grew up on my street and he was always telling us, say, no, that wasn't it. There was an ulterior motive. But we would start saving change. We would start to go through the, the cushions of the couch and look for quarters and nickels and dimes and pennies. My dad would walk every day. It was part of his physical exercise recovering from back surgery. And he would pick up any coins and sometimes dollar bills he would find and put them in his, his closet. He had a little coin tray and, and it would just stack up and stack up until about May and then all of a sudden it would all disappear because I would start saving his money for me, <laughs> right? So some of your parents know that, that experience, but if we could do odd chores around the house and, and I mowed the yard so I got a few dollars for that and so we're, we're putting back our money, which meant we didn't ride our bikes to Taco Bell for two months. We didn't go to the convenience store and buy candy and drinks and, and we didn't spend money on, on goofy stuff. We didn't buy you know, big video games and, and they weren't really that big, but they were expensive. We saved our money for fireworks. So you have to understand there's a reason behind this. Now, part of this thing was to, to do this fireworks display on our street, but we wouldn't get in the cul-de-sac and like, you know, do this demonstration in the show and play patriotic music. It was literally, this is where the PG-16 comes in, we would have World War III on our street. I know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I did know Jesus at this time, so there's really no excuse. I have to offer repentance from time to time for the things I did as a kid. But we would take two days and we would, we would get backpacks on, we would fill up with, um, you know, usually it was black cats and Roman candles and smoke bombs and, and things. It wasn't anything really extravagant, but we would buy tons of those things. <clears throat> and then we would break up into two teams. <clears throat> One team were the attackers. The other team were the defenders. And the reason we did that was one of our friends, his brothers, who were much older than us, they were in their 20s, had built this elaborate tree house in his backyard. Now the tree house was on the back fence and it backed up to a huge three acre plot that ran behind all the houses on the end of the neighborhood. And we had built an escape door. Turn a handle, push it out, you could jump out and run down the street and get to your house within minutes. And so the scheme was, we would say go, we would blow a whistle, and the, the attacking team would come from around the house and they would have their, their weapons of destruction and then the people in the fort were trying to defend what they had and whoever could last the longest throughout the day in the fort would end up winning the, the grand prize, which was just a bunch of candy. And so the first time I ever got to play this, I'm like nine years old and they've been doing this for a couple of years and I finally earned the right to jump into World War III and my dad had always made these threats, don't get involved in firecracker wars. Absolutely, Dad. I would never do that. PG-16, okay? And so we get to have the fort. I'm on the defender's team, and I've got like the bangaliers filled with, you know, taped on smoke bombs. 
and I've got you know, black cats around my waist, and I've got you know, these little things stuck, the Roman candles are in, and I'm ready. I mean, I've got my bag ready to go, and, and I look around, and I see my friends have their swim goggles, and I'm like, you guys are stupid. This is a firecracker war, and they looked at me and said, you're about to figure out how stupid you are. So we blow the whistle, the attackers come out from behind the house, and it's go time. I mean, there's just flares going everywhere. There's firecrackers popping, and smoke bombs are being, it looked like Vietnam had erupted in our backyard. There's just low-hanging smoke. And then all of a sudden, I began to find it really difficult to breathe. And I couldn't understand why, because these guys are out in front of us, and we're shooting these firecrackers. We're leaning outside, and we're going at it. And what I realized was, one of the guys had jumped over a fence, which I thought was breaking the rules, and he had come over and jumped again back behind the, the tree house, had snuck up along the ground, did a little army crawl, and he took four smoke bombs and he taped them underneath the tree house where the tree met the house and there were four gaps. He lit them, he taped them, and he crawled back across. So while we're focusing on the front, the back of the tree house is filling up with sulfur smoke. Now, if you've ever tried to inhale a smoke bomb, it is an impossible task. And so all of a sudden, I look around, and I'm about to throw up. And I look over to my right, and my friend has on his goggles, right? And he's sitting there up against the treehouse with a little knot hole, and he's breathing with his goggles, and he's still firing. And I, and I'm, I'm starting to tear up, like it's like tear gas. I look over, and these other guys have like the full face masks, and they're... And, and the fort is starting to fall because the one weak link hasn't decided to, to poke the, the smoke bombs out of the holes and keep fighting. And I don't have my goggles on. There's no more knot holes to breathe out of. And eventually I jump seven feet out of the treehouse onto the ground. And you have to wonder what's worse, the smoke or immediate fire from Roman candles? Because <laughs> now I'm the open target. And I realized that moment, sometimes defending the fort can be a really stupid action. I thought it was really safe, right? That we had these four walls covering us and we had control and we had the upper hand. We were at the top, of, kind of like trying to take the high ground. We had the upper hand. But I realized that that treehouse all of a sudden began to close in and become something very confining. Now, I thought that was just a kid mistake. I'm gonna jump back to World War II. Um, at the beginning of World War II, the French had made a decision that they didn't want the Germans to come back into France again. You see, World War I, the, the Germans had come across the southern border between Germany and France, and they had to come in and push the French army back because they couldn't defend the entire area. And so after World War I, they invested 3.3 billion francs to build a fort in the mountain along the southern border from the very southern end to the northern end. And the whole purpose was to keep the Germans out of France. They pitched the idea. The man who pitched it was a guy named Maginot. And that was what it was named after, was the Maginot Line. This fortress in the mountain and outside the mountains above and below was 300 miles long from start to finish. One continuous movement. 1.5 million cubic meters of concrete were used. And 2.5 meters, this compared to the Hoover Dam, there were 2.5 a um, million cubic meters used to build the Hoover Dam. So almost as much, we're probably about a million off, but you can see how much reinforcement was used. Steel, they used 150,000 tons of steel to build this fortress in the mountain. And like I said before, 3.3 billion francs. The idea was, if we can build a frontier fortress, we're gonna keep the Germans at bay. And there were two things that were the ultimate defeat of this massive fortress. And they weren't smoke bombs, by the way, but it was kind of that ridiculous. A rocket that cost $100,000 per rocket. And you launch it over the fortress into France, and there's no way the fortress can stop it. So now the fortress means nothing. And a $150,000 troop transport that flies so high above the fortress that even with anti-aircraft embankments, they couldn't stop the planes. And so you spilt all of this money on trying to secure your, your country and try to, to build this thing that you think is going to be secure. But the problem is you haven't thought through all the scenarios. You're thinking from World War I that the enemy is going to attack from the front. They're going to be honorable and it's going to be this trench warfare coming at you. And you're going to hold them at bay because you've got the greatest military structure that was ever built up to that point. And then they built something you never counted on. Small airplanes and rockets. 
And all of a sudden, all of your planning is out the window. The number two thing they did was, instead of coming at the southern border of France and Germany, they went through Belgium, which there was almost no resistance there. And so now we've got these people, several hundred thousand soldiers stuck in the mountain in France, having to evacuate and move down the forest because they thought the Arnon was, was a, a impenetrable place that they wouldn't come to. The Germans wouldn't attack through the forest. <clears throat> but here they come. And so now the, the French have to take their troops, pull them out of the mountain, and try to run down the line and meet them. And, and it's hundreds of miles of movements and major fiasco. And as you know, Germany ended up taking France pretty easily. You see, we sometimes put our, our faith and our hope in physical things, hoping that we can survive when the onslaught comes. Now, I don't know that you've gone out in your backyard and built a, a treehouse fort in case fireworks break out in your backyard, and I don't know if you've built a fortress around your house to keep people out, but sometimes we think in those terms that if I can build it tall enough, thick enough, and strong enough, I'm going to protect myself. But usually, that's because we are thinking about how we would fight, and we're trying to use the resources that are at our fingertips to engage in the battle. I want us to look at a scenario where we understand the work of God in this context. We've been studying the, the storyline of Joshua, and, and Joshua represents to us the embodiment of Jesus, and that and through Joshua having strength and courage that he was commanded from God, Jesus is our strength and courage. And so Joshua was given a command to march, they crossed the river, and now they're at one of the great fortresses that are, exists in the Canaan territory, the city of Jericho. So if you have your scriptures, Open with me to Joshua chapter 6. And as we read this, I want you to, to just listen along for what God was doing in the moment. Now, there's a backstory here before we jump in. This is the seventh day. So there's a, a little bit different storyline for the seventh day, but up until this point, there were six days of action. You see, they had spent a day um, a, a around Gilgal as they, they had communion. They observed the Passover. They observed what God had done. They had given thanks. And then God came to them and said, it's time for you to do circumcision. You have to make the people ready for, for what they're about to pursue and, and come into. And so they consecrate themselves to God. They set themselves apart from the people who are there. And they begin to look forward to the next city. Now, now, Jericho was this massive fortress. The entire city was encompassed by a, a wall, and it was so thick that some of the houses and some of the hotels or inns were built into the wall itself. People existed inside the wall. It was that thick. It wasn't just a single layer of bricks. We're talking yards thick. And so when we saw the, the, the spies come in, one or two men to enter the city quietly probably wasn't a big deal, but when you've got an army of probably hundreds of thousands coming across the river and marching, they're going to shut the city gates up. And so God had said to them, for six days, here's what I want you to do. The ark is going to go. You're going to have the, the trumpet blowers, the priests before you. We're going to put armed guards in front of them, and then the, the rest of Israel is going to march behind the, the ark of the covenant. And the presence of God will lead us around this fortress just once. And he said, in those first six days, tell the people not to make a single sound. Just march. Now, I've, I've visited the Holy Land, and I've been to this, this high mount place called Masada. And when the Romans besieged this place with the, the Israelites inside of it, and they encamped themselves, the Romans waited for a couple of days, and then they began to move earth to build a ramp to take them up to the, to the high points, because all the other routes that were going up had been sabotaged. And slowly and surely, they began to build a ramp to go up to the sacred place that the Israelites were, were waiting. They were trying to hide out and wait out long enough, and the Romans were so slow that all of a sudden, terror and tragedy began to, to strike inside the city. That may be one way to take a fortress city, Maybe another way is you find the weakest part of the wall, like what happened in, in, when uh, Nehemiah comes back and, and he's got Ezra with him, and they come back and look at the wall of Jerusalem, and they've got these weak spots. And some of the enemies would come into these places where gaps had formed, and they would come in and sabotage. So maybe you find a weak place, and you cause the wall to fall. But God doesn't use man's strategies to overcome the things that God wants to do. He overcome the actions of man to protect himself. And so what he does, he tells them to march around. Now, 
There is a, a song that goes along with the marching. And by the way, it also includes a French accent. You see, there's a, a cartoon rendition of what this would look like as the Israelites are marching around and the French peas are on top of the wall and they're humiliating the Israelites. Keep marching, because it's never gonna fall. Keep marching. Your brains are very small to be thinking that marching will be causing our walls to fall. So imagine the people are up on, the, on this thing and this, this army of people are marching around, their swords are in their scabbards, they're not even prepared for battle. And they march once the first day. And then they go home. Yeah, day's work. Go back home, take off your armor, sit down, relax, drink some juice, maybe have some bread, dip a little hummus, tell your stories of the great day of marching, and then you go to bed. Next day you get up, day two, march again. Day three, march again. And never a moment was there a word said during the period of marching. Complete silence. Day four, day five, day six, and then we come to this next day. And starting in verse 15 of chapter six, this is what it writes. It says, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Not once, but seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that was within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom she sent. Verse 18, but you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. Verse 19, but all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord, and they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted, and a great shout, and the wall <clears throat> fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all of the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. Now that's PG-17. This, this isn't a, a glorious marching and, and kind of a parade in downtown DC. This is a moment of conquest. And I want you to notice a few things. There are specific instructions that God gives the people of Israel. You are to march in this fashion. Don't have conversations, don't scream, don't yell, don't try to intimidate, this isn't your fight, I just need you to walk in a worthy manner. And they obeyed for six days, and on the seventh day they made seven trips around, and then it says in that scripture, it says at that moment of the seventh trip was completed, they began to blow the horns and the people shouted. Now there's all kinds of theories about how what, what actually happened, how it actually happened and what took place. Was it that the marching of seven days around the wall caused the, the earth to shift a little bit? Was it that the way they marched was in unison, and so that created a resonance within the earth which passed through the rocks and bricks and caused them to loosen their grip to each other, and it created a, a sonic movement within the earth that caused the walls to fall? Was it the fact that when they shouted at that moment, they shouted at such a frequency that the rocks could not handle and began to resonate together and the walls began to crumple and, 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 and fall? There's all kinds of ways to explain it, but here's the truth, that in this moment, God is not doing just something in the moment, but he's doing something for the next moment. Because what has just happened? Didn't he just hold the waters back in such a way that there was no destruction up or downstream? And he allowed the people of Israel to walk in front of the Ark of the Covenant, to pass in front of it, to be honored by God in that moment, to walk on smooth ground that was dry, and it was a miracle that God was showing, I am with you, I am in this moment. And so he goes from a natural phenomenon, a natural miracle, to now taking on the fortress of man. Do you have a fortress? Have you taken time because of your concern to start to build things around your life and around your heart and around your thoughts to protect yourself? You see, the only reason they have this wall is because of where they are strategically. 
they are close to the river Jordan, which means that outsiders coming in from the east could attack them with no problem. They're probably one of the first cities to come across. Next to them is a city called Ai, which are a bunch of farmers. We'll get to that story later, but, but if, if I've got a formidable defense here, then you're gonna drive armies that are coming to invade into the lesser cities. Ai probably was conquered dozens of times over the years it was in as a city. Jericho stood tall. They also can withstand any attack from within the land. You see, these aren't people who are aligned to each other. These are city-states that, that friction with each other and fight against each other. And Jericho is one of those cities you're probably not gonna go up against. But God takes on the works of man in a supernatural way which demonstrate who he is. Now, I wanna, I wanna give you one essential truth, and this isn't like complex truth, but I think it's appropriate for us today in the storyline of the people of Israel marching around a wall and it falling to, to highlight this one simple truth. And I want you to understand, the flesh cannot stand against God. The things of this world that, that do not acknowledge him, the works of man without the influence of God, the flesh cannot stand against him. This is one of the greatest examples of this, that all the years of planning and engineering and working to build a secure fortress to protect these people from warring nations failed. That was falling, and it was failing before they marched around the wall. If you remember the story a couple of weeks ago when Rahab's having a conversation, what does she say to the spies? The people's hearts have melted. So even though they have this strong structure, they realize that it's like a, a piece of paper up against the wind in, in the panhandle of Texas. It's not going to work out well. The things of the flesh cannot stand against God. We see this in three ways in this. One is there is a simple truth. and It's not a, a profound truth, but in the context of the spirit and the flesh working against each other, we see that sometimes the flesh can work against the flesh. You see that this, this wall was built up for one particular reason, to keep other armies out of the city. It's a pretty simple concept. At that time, they don't have rockets, and at that time, they don't have airplanes. They can't, they can't really even get rocks over the wall with accuracy, they're just throwing rocks, and sometimes they would, sorry parents, they would launch dead animals into the city to try to create chaos and havoc. They might launch fire, but if you've got structures built of stone, it may not work very well. But we think that the wall was high enough that those would have been impossible tasks for the nation of Israel that do not have trebuchets and they do not have catapults to launch these things over the wall. So this seems like it's an impossible task. And what we see is that the flesh can work against the flesh. The people of the flesh can fight against the people of the flesh, and it'll be accurate. If we want to take on each other, we can do that pretty well. I'm, I'm going to say that again because I think that one maybe deserves an amen or uh-huh or a mmm or maybe a nod of the head. But we have a really good option when we fight ourselves. Am I right? Can we not hurt feelings? Can we not draw blood? Against each other, the flesh can work against the flesh. And that's why it's important for us to remember in Scripture that, that when we talk about our battles as Christians and brothers and sisters, that it's not the flesh fighting against the flesh. But what we're remembering is there's a spiritual conflict that's taking place. But see, if, if I understand that I've had some success in the fleshly world, then I think that strength and that, that success can breathe into other areas. But if my resources are, are done appropriately and I, and I buy enough land and I have enough crops and I've watered enough and I've got enough head of cattle and I've got enough land spread out across the county and maybe I've got investments in other areas, not just in one sector, and maybe if I have enough kids, that, that will help protect me because that's a fleshly move. And it has helped in certain places. And sometimes that flesh against flesh breeds a false sense of confidence. If I go back to World War II, there was this huge campaign where Maginot began to talk about how impenetrable his fortress would be. And so when there was this murmur of the, the Germans beginning to move to attack, the French did nothing because they had hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the mountain, in the fortress. This thing was like eight stories tall. And in the bottom you had like you know, sewer services, right? And then you had like hospitals. And then you had like a train that went from one end, 300 miles to the other end, and it would transport cargo and people and supplies. 
And they could run that back and forth, this, this, this subway system. And then above that, you've got quarters, you've got places to buy food, and you've got places for the, the soldiers to sleep and officers to sleep. And then there's a whole room set up for diesel motors so they can circulate fresh air. You see, they were anticipating uh, germ warfare. They were anticipating gas warfare. And so they had a way to filter all these things. And so the, the French said, we're good. We, we, we've got this covered. There's no way Germany's going to come attack us. And they were depending upon the flesh to fight the flesh. But if we try to build those fortresses, sometimes we get caught trying to fight flesh against the spirit. And that thing becomes an obstruction for us. So I'm here to tell you, the flesh cannot stand up against God. You may try to build your embankment, you may try to build your encampment, you may try to protect yourself, but, but God is showing us today that those things do not survive. All it does is it keeps us away from participating with what he's doing. Not only do we see that the flesh can work against the flesh and kind of builds this false sense of confidence, but we also understand that God is greater than the evident, uh, efforts of the flesh. The people of, of Jericho spent years, maybe decades, building this wall, probably making modifications. There are probably some points that they were building the wall and the wall fell over. And so their engineers took a step back and said, why would that happen? Maybe we need to change the grade. Let's spread the base out a little bit. The, if the, the tip of the, the wall gets too tall, it becomes unstable and can be pushed over easily. So let's build it at a, at a degrade like this and let's build it more towards an angle so it can withstand. And maybe the back angle becomes higher than the front angle. And so they probably tried several things because they thought they would find something that would protect them and would work to, to make them have control over their area and the situations they would face. No matter how much engineering they put into it, who ends up winning the battle in Jericho? God does. God is greater than the evidence and efforts of the flesh. There's a term we use for this. The term is called omnipotence. And what that word means is the all perfect power of God. He's not just potent, but he's perfectly potent. He's not just powerful, but he's, he's all encompassing powerful. And so anything that is under him that he has created cannot stand up against him and he created all things. Okay, so let's say that they continue to build the wall thicker, 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 right? And, and maybe we want to build more encampments around our hearts and our emotions. We want to protect ourselves, so we keep putting more systems in place. Well, here's the thing. God knows exactly what you did, why you did it, and how you did it. And he knows where the weak points are that you never dreamed of. And we see over and over and over again in Scripture where man has tried to stand up against God. And scripture reminds us over and over and over again that man's efforts can never stand up to the power of God. And I will tell you this, in all the passages you've ever read, David and Goliath, right? Goliath standing against God and, and bad-mouthing him. Jericho, okay, a whale. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, you, you name it. Story after story, the Philistines coming and taking the ark. Whatever, whatever moments there were that seemed to be success for the enemy, God shows over and over again, there's a place of power we still have yet him see go to in this world. It's not because he can't go there. It's because he chooses to hold some things from us. We can't comprehend it. We have not seen the limit to his power. How many have ever made something in your entire life? A, a loaf of bread, a, a chair, a frame, you laid tile, you built a house, you, you, you fenced in a, a ranch or a farm. Most of us have had our hands stitching and knitting or something. I mean, if you got this morning and you put cornflakes into a bowl and you, and you put some milk in it, you made breakfast. Good job, right? And we, we kind of get proud when we see our kids do that for the first time. Now, sometimes we get concerned about how big the bowl is and how many cornflakes they put in that bowl and maybe the size of the spoon they want to eat you with, but hey, you made yourself breakfast, so good job. Make your bed. How about that one? Why don't you go make that? But here's the thing, is that we have to use elements that are already existing to make something. Do you want to know what the power of God can do? He creates the elements. We know how water is put together, but we have a really hard time making water. 
It is a nonchalant, easy task for God to make the elements and put them together in the exact right way because of his power and his knowledge. We cannot stand up against that. So if, if the efforts of the flesh kind of breed false confidence and God continues to show that he's greater than the flesh, then fear reveals your dependence. When we see the work in, in Jericho, what are they afraid of? Somebody, I mean, literally raise your hand with walls as thick and, and put together as they were. What were the people of Jericho afraid of? Wind? Water? Somebody tell me, what were they afraid of? Other people, right? Other, other armies. They're afraid of the, the farmers over in AI. They're afraid of the other armies that are going to be further down the road. They're afraid of the people up in Tel Dan who, who may come down to the south and attack them. And they're afraid from maybe there are people on the ocean that will come over and, and make landfall. And they will come attack. They're afraid of people. And so their fear reveals what they put their confidence in, which is themselves and their abilities. So here's the question for you this morning. In your moments of fear... What are you putting your confidence in? In the past four years, there have been many moments of fear in our culture, in our society, in our city. And we have all taken actions against those things that we're afraid of. Where did you reveal that your confidence lies? Did you take control of yourself? Did you try to influence it? Did you try to change the circumstances? Did you try to influence people? Did you try to buy your way out or invest your way into? What was it that you did that revealed where the confidence that you have for this life is, is, is put into? It, it has, has this place where you spend your energy and efforts. Where is your confidence? You see, the people of Jericho, they put their confidence in the things of this earth and their abilities to build the wall. The people of Israel, who are highly at risk, walking around this wall where, where maybe hot oil can be poured down, large rocks can be put on their heads, there, there may be arrows, there, there may be slings, who knows what could come at them, but they're walking unprotected around the wall. Why would they do such a stupid thing? Because their confidence wasn't in themselves. It was in God and following what he said Exactly to the point. So I go back and ask the question, where's your wall? What stronghold have you allowed to be created in your life? Do, do you put your, um, your strongholds, do you put your confidence in power? Do you put your confidence in control? How about economy? We're searching for something to take care of the things. I wonder, what has God revealed to you that you have put your faith in, put your confidence in? But what we see with God is this, that God develops faith and obedience in these times when fear demonstrates itself. If we put our confidence in him, then he is guaranteed to do three things. He demonstrates that he has power. The wall falls, and when it falls, it doesn't just crumble down like we would destroy a building today. It falls actually in, which doesn't ever happen with a building in a circle. Usually the circle falls out, but it falls in on itself, and when it does, it begins to kill people. And the resistance that would have been there falls. And then it says they go in and they take the city with almost no losses. Not because of who they were, not because of poor building strategies or the failures of, of the, the Jerichoans to, to not build properly, but because God's power is all powerful and it's perfect. And we put our trust in him, we put our confidence in him, he reveals himself over and over and over that he is powerful enough to handle this. Number two, we realize that he really is in control. Rahab said that our, my people are melting because they know that your God is the one true God. And she had made that confession. But it probably wasn't that moment until if I'm a Jerichoan and I'm standing behind the wall and I'm thinking, I'm good. They can sing, they can march, they can blow. They really have bad horns. Those ram's horns are really, that's a bad sound, but I got this. I'm behind this wall and they're probably talking to their friends. I mean, these Israelites, they're a bunch of a hicks, a bunch of idiots. They don't understand what walls do. They kind of protect us, right? And at that moment, all of a sudden, something begins to move. And when the wall began to fall on me as a Jerichoan standing behind it for protection, I probably realized at that point, God's in control. Smash. 
You, you see what I'm saying? When something is out of your control, you don't realize it until you feel the negative effects. Until you wake up one day and this marriage you started out years ago that you thought you had control over is disintegrating. And you realize the more you try to control it, the more it falls apart. And I begin to realize I really don't have control. As parents, we hear this, right, in, in one of two ways. One, when people come to us and say, man, your kid is one of the greatest kids I've ever met. And it was at that perfect moment, right, when, when there were struggles going on at home and things were not perfect. When that person said that to you, you thought, Do you, are we talking about the same kid? You're talking about my child, the one, the one who's in your class that I've had all kinds of conferences with you. About. You're saying they're a pretty good kid, huh? You look at that kid and they're like, <laughs> they're smiling. Yeah, things are good. Okay. And you realize, I, I really can't always control them. And then we hear the other side of the story, right? The parent calls and said, hey, um, we need to talk about your, your child. And you thought you had them in a place where you had some influence and, and you had some way to kind of control their behaviors. And as a parent, you realize the older they get, the less control you have. I may try to, to, to do some digs, I may try to influence, I may try to command and dictate, but the more I try to do those things, what do I realize? I'm losing more and more control of the situation. But when God steps in, there is no other option. You submit to his control, willingly or disobediently. When, when the end time comes and, and it says that Jesus arrives, what will every person do? They will bow. There won't be a, a contingency of people who say, I refrain from doing that. I have the rights as an American to stand or, or kneel. I can do whatever I want. It says in that moment when Jesus shows up, every knee will bow. <clears throat> and then what's the second thing? Every tongue will confess. And either it will be in joy. You are Jesus, the Christ, yes. You get down in a place of submission. You cry out because he's here. Or you're on the other side and your knees are bleeding because you were forced into a position and you're screaming and crying, please forgive me. I didn't realize this was true. But every person will kneel and every person will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what control is. He demonstrates his power. He demonstrates his control. And here's the blessing for us today. The wall reminds us that when it crumbles, he's doing everything he can to draw us into his economy. But he controls all these factors. And he wants to bring us into this thing that he's doing. And if we're brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ, have a relationship with God and live in peace, and are being worked upon by the Spirit to become more like Christ every day, we live in that economy with joy and thanksgiving. That what he gives to me is the perfect gift. And what he takes from me is perfectly taken. And what he, what he pushes me towards and calls me to do, he will equip me to do it. And there will be times he will put me in a place that he's going to give me more than I can handle. You just heard your pastor say, there are more things than you can handle. And what does it cause you to do? To go back to the cross and plead the blood of Jesus and say, I need your help. Because he's the one who has the ability to never have more than he can handle. But I have access to him. And in that, I get to experience blessings. Mothers who never thought they could have children, and one day, they're screaming. Men who thought, I will never find a person to walk with me in this life. And somebody throws a stare their way and gives a little wink. People who thought, I'm stuck in this job, and all of a sudden, there's an opportunity for increase and growth and maybe influence. And we thought, maybe I have no other resources to give, and all of a sudden, God begins to pour things upon us. You see, when he takes his control, and when he demonstrates his power, and we live in relationship with him, guess what we get to do? Accept the blessings. Doesn't mean that the blessings are always lovey-dovey, joyful, I, uh, happiness, I like this. Sometimes these blessings come through difficult times. The wall falls. And the Israelites are the ones who benefit. But I want, I want to finish on this one aspect. Why in the world would God of all creation, who has the ability to literally pluck the people out of this city, leave everything behind, they're removed, and say to the Israelites, come, I have prepared a place for you. Take your home. 
Come live in the wall that's safe and, and come take the houses that I prepared for you. And there's still food in the jars. And there's olive oil and there's flour and the fruits are still hanging and the cows are still in the stalls. All of this is for you. Why wouldn't he just give them this city? Because his vision was for a land and not for a city. He wanted them to take the entire place that Abraham had looked at from the north to the south and to the east and the west. But the Israelites had a problem, and sometimes we're the same way. If I take you back really quickly to the place where the Israelites are in the desert, and they're coming across some hard times, it's, it's hot, it's dry, and they're thirsty, and they need food, and rather than turn to God, what do they begin to cry out? Take us back to Egypt. For 400 years, they lived enslaved in the Egyptian culture, treated as chattel, treated as, as subhuman, beaten, and put into submission. And God frees them. And the moment they face any kind of resistance, <clears throat> their desire, their heart, their first reaction is, I want to go back to where I think I know what can happen. I want to control this and go back to Egypt. And sometimes in our craziness, spiritual craziness, when God is walking us through a territory to get into a promised moment, there's resistance. And what do they say in, in the work world? Better the devil you know and the devil you don't know. It's okay if I have a crazy person that I have to work with, but at least I know the craziness and I can kind of work around that. But if I go to a new job, who knows what the craziness is gonna be? And so God takes this city that had so much potential to be a stronghold and to become a place where they can kind of maneuver out of and he destroys it because he doesn't want them to stay in Jericho. He has a greater plan for them. And I want you to know that the place that you consider to be a safe place for you, that you can go and you've got this thing built around your heart and your mind and, and the things of God are trying to break in, but if he doesn't destroy that, the moment you face any kind of opposition, guess where you'll go back to? The encampment. The moment you face pushback from relationships and you'll go back to the brokenness of relationships that you think you understand and how you interact with people, and how you accept what they say to you, and what you say back to them, you'll go back to that place. And Jericho exists only because you allow the walls to maintain a building structure. And God is saying to you, let me destroy this, because what I want you to experience is something you've never seen before, and it's a greater place than you've ever lived, it's a greater moment than you've ever existed, and it's a greater love than you've ever experienced. Let him destroy that stronghold to never come back to it. And that's hard. I had a friend of mine who um, was living in St. Louis. God had not redeemed him from his false belief of the St. Louis Cardinals being the best basketball team in the world. I still pray for his, his knowledge. But he moved to Virginia. And he said one day he woke up and he felt like God was speaking to him in a dream, and he began to read scripture, and, and just over and over again, God began to kind of push on him. It was time to make a move. Now, he was successful. He's a, a civil engineer. He was an architect. But he just felt like God was saying, it's time to move. Now, he didn't say anything to his wife. He's got two little kids. And um, the next day, his wife wakes up and says, I just have been reading and listening to the songs that God has been bringing on my mind and what I've heard and the scripture I've read and the conversations. I'm listening to sermons. And, and, and Mark, I think it's time for us to move. And Mark kind of drops his jaw and looks at her and says, I think it's time for us to move too. And he said, Kevin, literally what happened was, a few days later we called a, a realtor. We left town, our house hadn't sold. No job, no resources, no connections, no relationships. And God had called them to move to the DC area. Within five days of arriving, they buy a house, $100,000 below market value, which in that time, the DC was on the bubble and houses were selling 1,800 square feet, like $400,000. It's crazy. Then they do a little bit of work to it, but he's an architect, not a problem. He walks over to a friend of his next door, this new house he moved in, who is working on the project, which is a brand new project in DC. It's, it's south of DC in, um, in, in Dumfries. And they were beginning to do the project for the Marine Museum. The Marine Museum was only on paper, and they were looking for an architect who had experience to come in and help them to begin the process of overseeing the construction. 
And he met the army colonel who is retired, who's in charge of the building process. That's his next door neighbor. And he said, um, Joe, I've actually got construction experience. And he said, well, give me your resume and show up Tuesday and we'll see what we can do. He becomes one of five foremans overseeing the construction of the Marine Museum in Dumfries, Virginia. Making $20,000, $30,000 more a year than he was making at his old job. And God draws him to our church where he knows nobody. And I'm thinking to myself, you're a freak. <laughs> why would you leave a house unsold? And why would you move someplace with no resources? And you got no job and you, and you got no place to be and you got no people. And he looked at me and said, we actually know five people now. We got people. We got a home. I might have a job. And he began to tell me the story, how it just continued to unfold, that his kids found friends and, and all the things, because he came to a place where if he held on to the house that he had and he stayed in the place that he was told that he had kind of built for himself, that he would be living behind the wall. And that's the words he used out of this story. Seven years later, guess what he does? He leaves the house unsold, he walks away from an architectural job and moves to Missouri. Because his wife and he feel like she's called to start providing in-home care for, for senior citizens. And I'm thinking to myself, you've gone weird again. <laughs> what are you doing? He said, it's nothing I can do. If I stay here, I'm living behind this wall again. Church, I'm telling you, God has been demonstrating to us over and over and over again that we have these walls we've built up through our experiences, and sometimes it's what people have done to us and what we've done to others, but God wants to destroy those walls. He wants to, us to let go of those strongholds so we can walk in victory, so we can walk being blessed. And we have to remind ourselves that sometimes when those walls get built up, we begin to fight against each other. But what we see here is when, when the, um, the people of God are in unison and walking together and they meet difficult times together and they honor and love each other in such a way that they follow the commands, even if they don't make sense, God honors that, he blesses, and he comes through in big ways. And God in his providence shows that this is the storyline for our church for today. Praise God for him paying attention to us. So I want to end with this right here, our closing thought. Um, this, now go back to the, the picture real quick. This is the picture taken um, looking towards the west. This is the eastern wall of the Temple of Jerusalem. Behind here is the, the, the Dome of the Rock. This is a Muslim temple that's actually in the temple grounds. There is no more um, Jew, Jewish temple or, or Christian worship it, this area that's on the inner courts is all controlled by the Muslims. There are entrances to this. There's probably eight or nine of them that you can walk in through. The, the, the sheep gate, the lion gate, there's all kinds of gates you can walk in. This is called the eastern gate. This is the only one that is closed up. You can see here that there are two arches that are a walkway. And at one point, there would have been giant doors that they would have opened on the day to come in to worship in the temple. And this is sitting here with a temple dome behind it. Over here, is, there's a, like a museum kind of place, and we think that this is where the, the, the uh, table changers were at, the, 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 the people who were selling goods, and Jesus kicks it over. If you walk across straight away on the other side of the dome, there's an entrance into the Arab Quarter. You can get really good hot coffee there. But when you look at this, this is the only entrance that's, that's concreted up. It's closed off. And you think to yourself, what is going on? On the inside, they have railing and they have ropes blocking it off. If you get within 15 feet of this, of this area, the, the guards on the temple grounds will come after you. They'll yell at you. They'll blow whistles. They'll have sirens. And they come for you. They don't want anyone near this on the inside. Now, the question becomes, why would they do that? Okay, well, let me explain one other thing. Here's the, I believe the Valley of Kidron is here. This is Mount Moriah, okay? On this side coming up here are all these Jewish tombstones. And there's these memorial markers. And, and towards the top of that, there's a place where there's a sarcophagus and a, and a tomb, and you can go in and see what it looked like, the time period of when Jesus would have been buried. There's bone boxes that have been stuck in these little cubbies, people's names on them. But on this side, there's all of these tombs that are all these head markers for Jewish people. And then you have the, the river, the valley, and then it comes up, and right here along this side are all Muslim burial places. The Muslims have done this to desecrate this place. 
Because the prophecy says when the Messiah comes, he will come through the east. He will come from the east to the eastern gate, and he will demonstrate his presence when he walks through this gate. And so the Muslims have desecrated this with burials. There were people who willingly said, I want to be buried right here because I think this is ridiculous, and I want to spit on this place. I want to put a dead body, something unclean, on a sacred spot. Then they took yards of concrete and block this thing in. They don't want anybody walking through here to be mistaken as the Messiah. Some dude walking around with a sheet kind of comes to the Eastern Gate and people go crazy. So they block it off. Then they protect it. And they're doing everything they can to keep the Messiah from coming. And so I look at our tour guide and I said, uh, Naftali, I've got a question. Does that bother you? That, that concrete's there? I mean, every time he started a, a response, well, how do you guys handle this? I mean, that would make me furious. I'm kind of getting upset about it. He goes, Kevin, uh, yeah. the Messiah doesn't care about concrete. I thought for a second, <laughs> you're probably right. If Jesus did show up, he would probably just walk over here and like blow a kiss, and he would just destroy it, right? Or maybe he walks up and does a Chuck Norris kick, and it, <laughs> maybe he just looks at it, and he, you know, he says, go away, and it just disappears. But anyway, he wants to, that concrete, doesn't have to stay there. Maybe Jesus says, hey, you can have your concrete and just walks through the concrete on his own and doesn't disrupt anything, just shows up on the other side. You see, the Messiah doesn't respond to the physical in fear. But mankind has tried over and over and over again to stop the Messiah from coming because they live in fear. You see, we try over and over again to control the things we're afraid of. And God over and over again demonstrates that he is the God over all creation. We've been saying this time and time again in this series, and I want us to finish off with this idea. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, my strength and courage, that dude destroys strongholds. And because he does that, I'll take a step. What is it he needs to destroy with you today? What is it he's trying to demonstrate his power and authority and control over the situation? What is it he's speaking to you? Child of mine, I got this. You just need to walk. You may be afraid, but your fear is revealing something that's unhealthy. Be afraid of me. If you're gonna be afraid of something, fear me, but fear in, in reverence. Come into my presence with thanksgiving, but know that I have control over all the universe. Just take a step. And I pray that for you, that wall that has been up because of what mom and dad maybe did, maybe an employer did, maybe a brother or sister did, somebody said something, and that voice has continued to ring inside of you and it's built up this hardness around you, that because of Jesus Christ, it is destroyed. And you have the chance to live in God's blessings because of his power and his strength and his control. Is that a good thing? To take a step in confidence because I know that Jesus destroys those things for my benefit, is that a good thing? And so I encourage you to experience that today. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful that we see some incredible things that happen in storylines, and they aren't just images, but they are the things that actually happened. Now, Father, we, we know that, that we are not called to walk around any walls here in Perryton. Um, we got a few fences. There might be some metal buildings, and uh, there, you know, there's a silo or here or there, and might be a, an embankment maybe, but we're not called to march around those things. But Father, what you've shown us is that because of who Jesus is and what you've called him to do with his strength and his courage that he provides for us, that we put our trust in him. That Father, when we see that there are those strongholds, that we pray that they be destroyed because we never want to go back to those places again. Father, you've shown us that if we will obey you, that we'll be faithful to listen to you, we'll be faithful to walk with the community. And as they've heard and affirmed what we've been told and what we sense and what we read and what we hear, that, Father, we respond together, and there are great things that will happen. We acknowledge your sovereignty over all life and over all things that exist. And this morning, we pray together that, Father, because of your power and your strength, that you will destroy the things that keep us from living in your economy. And so, Father, we make this declaration together. Destroy our strongholds. 
And let us walk in Jesus' strength and confidence. And so now, Father, in this next moment, deal with us. Let your spirit attend to us. And may we respond as faithful children. We pray these things because of Christ's name. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to the front. We're going to take a moment just to spend some time in prayer. I'm going to encourage you to, to respond to God and how he's leading. And maybe that's right there in your chair. You know the thing that's in, kind of encamped around your heart. Maybe it's your emotions. Maybe it's your resources. And, and God is revealing because the places of fear that you might have, that there's a place of dependence upon something else other than God. Maybe this morning you sense God saying to you, that thing has no more control over you. You are my child, I am your king and your father, and I want you to walk in blessed ways. Maybe this morning you still have concerns. Maybe enough rain hasn't fallen. Maybe the, the, the market hasn't bounced back the way it should. Maybe you're trying to figure out what the next step is. How do I demonstrate my faith in God and walk forward in something I really don't know how to control or even to give up control? Well, these people here at the front will pray with you. Maybe you need to grab somebody next to you. There'll be names posted on the screen back behind me and on the side, and it's people who have called in for, for prayer requests. Maybe they've lost a family member. I want to take a moment and say something before we pray. I was reminded this week of why this is one of the best places in this city to worship God. Now, you know what? I'll be honest with you, and hopefully this doesn't offend you. I like First Baptist. I like Richard. He's a great pastor, and I like that congregation. I got family over there. I kind of like First Christian. Dan Anderson and I went to the same college together. Different, a little bit different time period. He's a little bit older than I am. But, but I like him. He's got good care. He's a good pastor. And, and Joe Stepp and I have kind of been in step with each other and hang out and, and have fun. And, and Southside's a great place. And First United Methodist and Victory and Harvest. These churches we have around here, there are some great Bible teaching churches that are worshiping God and some great pastors who are over those people. But I'm thankful that I'm called here. And I saw that twice this week, when two days, back to back, over 100 people were able to come to this location and receive love and care from these people, you who worship here. And you paid attention and cared for the pools, and you paid attention to the, the pledgers, and you fed them physically and spiritually. You guys were coming out of the woodwork to provide as much food as we possibly could use. And you demonstrated to this community that this is a place of serious love and serious care in complicated times. This is a good place to bring people because of you, because of what God's doing through you. And I'm grateful for that. And so maybe you need to come and just give thanks that we have that kind of church. Maybe we need to come and pray this morning for the names that we brought up because of loss. We have families who have been grieving. We have a family this morning that's gonna be going through a funeral service tomorrow. They're grieving. Maybe we need to come and bring their name before the throne. I just encourage you, however God works with you to respond to what he has said to you, that you have a moment to do that. If that's being prayed over, that's praying in your chairs, if it's coming kneeling at the altar, you make that decision about how you respond. But God has said something to you today. Don't wait. Don't resist. Let's stand together and we pray. And as God leads you, you respond.